So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. <laughs> so if we would just think in consciousness, reason in consciousness about, about what we are saying, about how we are reasoning, huh? if we would just come out from that infinite one and reason truly in accord with it, we would find that there's nothing outside of the range and the realm of that infinitude. That everything is the one being in expression. That nothing is going on but that seven-fold nature of God operating according to the Christ calculus. The calculus is the Christ idea. It's the way the Christ idea works. How the Christ is going to work out the idea of God. Not your human idea. Not my human expectations. Not what I think is the utmost, the best, the most ideal. Not what the human considers ideal. But what the Christ knows to be ideal. To be in coincidence with the highest idea of God. This is what the calculus is working out. It is the Christ. So whenever we speak of the calculus, you know this is the Christ working. It is the Christ that has your best interest at heart, your highest good, the greatest excellence in view, and doesn't only envision that and have a, an idea of that, but is able to execute that to bring that about, to carry that out to fulfillment, to fulfillment, to complete fulfillment. So you hear really already in the calculus or in that Christ idea, the sense that there is the, the seeing, the conceiving of the greatest good, the highest good, the essence of good and then not only not leaving it at that you see not only that that would be from the word standpoint did we say that to to have that vision to see that to conceive of of that good of what is good and this is all a question of the Christ what is good so often we think we know what is good. Huh? What is good for me? What's good for this experience? What would be the best thing? And we, we work and we try to move heaven and earth humanly and in our practice to bring that about. Not realizing that the calculus, the Christ, says that's exactly what you have to put on the altar, that's what you have to lay down before God. Put that before God. Give that up. Sacrifice that. Subject that. Subordinate that to the Christ. Subordinate that to there being a principle that is love that wants to work with you and to bring out that good which is beyond, so far beyond what you think good is, what you have conceived good to be. And so the Christ, the calculus at the point of the word, knows, it conceives of this good. 
of what the idea of God is. And as the Christ, see, so the point of the word, it conceives of that. At the point of the Christ, it begins to execute that, to bring that about. It's not just sitting and having a a wonderful vision and, oh, isn't that beautiful? There's nothing more beautiful, but not having the power to do anything about it, not having the will to express it, the power to express it. This is the innately the Christ. And so in the calculus, you see the Christ is that power to bring it about, to bring it to manifestation, to bring it to expression. That's, that's the Christ, the Christ in the calculus. And bringing it to expression, it brings it to the fullness of that expression. It isn't just partially expressed, partially brought about, but it is brought out to the greatest extent, to the fullest measure, and this is Christianity. This is what Christianity means. Christianity says, what is it that can hold, that contains the infinite measure of that expression of good, of the idea of God, of what God has in mind. And this is, this is Christianity. So you get the fulfilled sense in Christianity, that full fullness, that fulfillment, that allness, that that idea of God will fill the whole universe. Even though it seems to be all to do with you, it's filling the allness of the all. Isn't that a miracle? It's science. It isn't really a miracle. It's science that says you cannot have good in just one place. You can't have the solution to a question, to a problem, to your individual problem of being. You can't have that in just one little corner of the universe where you are, where you think you are. Because you are everywhere. You are wherever being is, being is. Wherever being, capital B is, being, small b is. And you are being, small b. You are the expression of being. And that's everywhere, really. And so what you are working out with the calculus, as you move with the calculus in consciousness, and that calculus moves with you and moves you, it is filling the whole universe. That which the Christ is bringing out, that good is filling the universe. So you can't work out something in isolation. Hmm? Can you? Can you work out something all by yourself and keep it for yourself? Huh? It belongs to the whole universe. What you work out, you work out for the whole world. This is the wonder of consciousness. This is the meaning of consciousness, that consciousness is everywhere. It is ever-present, ever-present and omnipresent. So you work out whatever you work out. Think of it. Whatever you work out on the basis of the sevenfold nature of God and the fourfold operation of God, you really work out with the sevenfold nature of God and with the fourfold operation of God. And you work it out for all time and all space, for all times too, you see that you don't just work something out for this moment in time, for place in time, for a certain period, but because you have worked it out according to the very nature of the Infinite One, the very operation of the Infinite One, you work it out infinitely. It's an infinite demonstration that you make. 
on the basis of the calculus. And so you see that uh, that we have that fourth point of science in the calculus, that the Christ would say these three, word, Christ, Christianity, are one. They are science. That is science. When you understand the word, the Christ, and Christianity, you understand science. Science will always show you it is word, Christ, and Christianity. That those three are one. They are one divine principle. One divine principle working. One divine principle in operation. Well, there are just so many beautiful, beautiful aspects to this calculus and to what the calculus is doing as it governs the expression of the divine nature at every level of experience. You know, I don't know how I got here, but I'm glad I did. And I wanted to to tell you, I can't even remember now how we began to unfold that. We started to talk about what we were seeing last year because I think that as we finished last year, at least for myself, and I know that one or two others mentioned to me that we had taken those seven, those seven as the days of creation, those days of creation really patterning or coining what we call the thousand-year periods, those periods that seem to be time periods but are really um, the fact that the seven days of creation, which are timeless values, are always making their impact on time, are bringing out through that sevenfold impact the whole history of mankind, the whole history of the individual, the collective, and the universal consciousness. So we were seeing that last year, and at the close of that session, one began to feel immediately what what was missing. What was missing was the calculus. So I I loved that fact that what we needed to do was to give to those 7,000-year periods their calculus setting. We needed to now focus. It doesn't mean that something was wrong with the previous session. It means that the accentuation was such as it was and that now that accentuation wants to shift as the, as the further great category of being begins to assert itself and become more predominant within consciousness. So the four would come in and say, now you know what you must see is that those seven are not working on their own. They're not operating on their own. They don't move on their own. They don't move because a generation comes along, a thousand-year period generation of sorts comes along and says, all right, we've fulfilled these, uh, these requirements. We've re- fulfilled the requirements for the first thousand-year period. Now a new generation has to come, come along and take up new requirements so that that a generation that fulfilled the requirements of the first thousand-year period would give way to a, a new generation of consciousness that fulfills the requirements of the second thousand-year period, which will be all coined and stamped with spirit. It's so beautiful. I never get tired of it, and apparently I don't, because every time I think I have something new to tell you, and I'm just so excited about it. I pick up something that I did 10 or 15, 17 years ago, and it's there already. I've already said it. (laughs) 
and you are so kind. You keep coming back. <laughs> you can't remember either. Yeah. <laughs> but it's because these categories are so deep, deeply embedded. They are, they are the deep, deep, deep structure of everything. Hmm? So one keeps discovering them and rediscovering them and rediscovering them again. And it's not really that you stay in the same place. You always rediscover what you've already discovered <laughs> in a new way. There's something so new about it, so fresh, so, so quickening. It just, it just picks me up. It, it t- captures my heart and carries me away. I, uh, you know, it's like that fifth day of creation where the, uh, the bir- birds are, they soar in the open firmament of heaven. They, they are filled with the aspirations of being, of life. And that's the way it feels to me. And so I'm always a little surprised when I find that I had said something or seen the same thing in a certain way. But what else can we do? <laughs> We've only got three great categories. You know that, don't you? That we have one being, that one being unfolds, begins to unfold itself to render itself understandable through its innate categories. Because that one being is science. It's science. So it is that which innately is able to render itself understood and understandable. So it does that through its scientific categories, through the categories of the science of being. What a, what a majesty that is. That no one can get away from that. No one will ever be able to hide from that. This is built in to the experience, to each one's experience. Because the scientific method works inductively as well as deductively, you'll never get away from it. You'll never be able to escape the finding out of what God is and what you are, what you really are. You'll never be able to get away from finding out what the nature of God is and what your true nature is. How God operates and how your whole being operates in one great self-operation of being. Now, I'm not just speaking to the people in this room, but to everyone, everyone that walks this planet is learning what God is and how God operates because of science, because of the fact that being is a science. This is exactly what the 7,000-year period wants to, to show us to impel upon us, to impact us with the fact that we have a science and that we cannot escape our divine salvation. We cannot escape salvation. <laughs>